Welcome to our new unit, Unit 8 on Cellular Respiration. And we can't understand cellular respiration without enzymes, so we're going to talk about enzymes too. And this is our first notes video of the unit. You can't understand cellular respiration without enzymes, and you can't understand enzymes without knowing about metabolism and free energy diagrams first. So that's what this video is about. This video is going to cover the three goals listed here. We've actually studied metabolism before in our ecology and biochemistry units. We just didn't call it metabolism. Simply defined, metabolism is how molecules are built up and broken down. Metabolism is the driving force behind how energy flows and nutrient cycle through the ecosystem. And this is what we talked about in ecology. Hopefully you remember that a lot of nutrient cycles and energy flows start with plants. Plants build up macromolecules like glucose through photosynthesis. Photosynthesis is metabolism. Plants also take in other molecules through their roots and leaves and do other metabolic building reactions. This is what we called um, assimilation before. Consumers, like this giraffe and this lion over here, are heterotrophs, and they eat other organisms to get their energy and nutrients. Metabolism plays a role here when compounds that are eaten are broken down by metabolic processes to release energy and release the nutrients, and then the nutrients that are released by these metabolic reactions can be built up by other metabolic reactions into new molecules. Metabolism isn't some magical thing. Metabolism is just chemistry, biochemistry. Again, metabolism is simply chemical reactions that build up or break down molecules. We talked about metabolism in our biochemistry unit by looking at catabolic and anabolic reactions. Remember, catabolic reactions are where molecules are broken down and anabolic reactions are um, ones where molecules are built up. And the examples on this slide a disaccharide is being broken down in a catabolic reaction, or a disaccharide is being built in an anabolic reaction. For a little bit of refresher, catabolic reactions are reactions that break chemical bonds. In our biochemistry unit, we called this process hydrolysis, where molecules of water are used to split polymers into monomers. In this example, the glycosidic bond of sucrose is being broken down in a hydrolysis reaction to give two monosaccharides, glucose and fructose. The new information that we're going to be focusing on in this unit is what happens with energy. Catabolic reactions release energy when chemical bonds are broken. Energy that was stored in the bonds is released, and that released energy can be used to do cellular work. The name for a reaction that releases energy is an exergonic reaction. For a quick refresher on anabolic reactions, anabolic reactions are where polymers are built. Polymers are built when chemical bonds are made between monomers. In the biochemistry unit, we call these type of reactions dehydration synthesis reactions. In the example shown here, two monosaccharides, glucose and fructose, are being linked together by dehydration synthesis to make a disaccharide, sucrose, by forming a glycosidic bond, shown here. In terms of energy, anabolic building reactions have a different name. Anabolic reactions require an input of energy to build bonds. The name for a reaction that requires energy input is an endergonic reaction. So at this point, I hope you can kind of appreciate the different terms we can use to describe these reactions. All of these reactions are part of metabolism. When focusing on building up and breaking down, we can use the terms catabolic and anabolic. But if the focus is the role of water in this process, that's where we would use hydrolysis and dehydration synthesis, focusing on the water. 
But now that we're focusing on energy, we need new terms. We're going to use exergonic and endergonic. With our focus on energy, we're going to use free energy diagrams to follow changes in energy throughout reactions. While the name free energy diagram might be a little bit intimidating, a free energy diagram is simply a graph where reaction progress is plotted on the x-axis and free energy is plotted on the y-axis. I know that G is a weird letter to use to represent energy, but in this case it's from a scientist with the last name Gibbs that was important for understanding how all of this stuff works, so that's why we have G for Gibbs, but I like to think about it as energy. Another essential part to understanding a free energy diagram is to connect back to chemistry basics. Remember, the chemical compounds that start off a chemical reaction are called reactants, so they're going to be at the start in time of this diagram right over here on the left, and then products are the chemical compounds that are left at the end of a reaction. So the part of this graph that represents where the products are are over here on the right. So with reaction progress or time on the x-axis, the reaction starts with reactants and ends with products. Now, let's fold in our new information about reaction types, endergonic and exergonic, so we can complete the story. These are free energy diagrams, and one is for an endergonic reaction and one is for an exergonic reaction. And I know your first instinct for seeing this for the first time is to kind of freak out. So I know it's going to be difficult at first, but take a deep breath and figure out what you need to look for, and this process isn't going to be bad at all. So first, before we dig too deep, let's just start and kind of find our, our level ground here. Let's check out the basics of the graph. Both have energy on the y-axis, energy and energy, and both have time on the x-axis. So this is just a graph. In both cases, the graphs start with reactants on the left and end with products on the right. The thing that looks a little bit intimidating is this curve here. But let's take a look at what the graphs are telling us about energy of reactants and products, and I think you'll see that this isn't too bad. Simply by reading the energy levels at the beginning and the end of the reactions, you can see that the graph on the, le graph on the left shows that the products have more energy than the reactants. On the right, you can see that the reactants have more energy than the products. On the left, for the products to increase in, ener in energy, there must be an energy input. By definition, then, this is an endergonic reaction. The energy put into the reaction is used to build bonds, which makes the products have higher energy, and this is an anabolic building reaction. On the right, for the products to have lower energy, this means that the extra energy was released. In other words, this is an exergonic reaction. The released energy came from breaking chemical bonds. So this is also a catabolic reaction. Now, let's put all of this together. All right, in endergonic reactions, there's an overall energy input. The energy that's put in is put in the reactants so that the products have a higher free energy. For example, photosynthesis, using energy to stick together carbon dioxide molecules and water to make high-energy sugar. Exergonic reactions have an energy release. Energy is released when bonds are broken in a reactant so that the products have a lower free energy than the reactants. Now, when we look at this difference between free energy and reactants and products, that has a name, and the name of that change is delta G, change in free energy. Let's take a closer look at delta G. When studying free energy diagrams, we have to do some calculations, and the first calculation that we're going to look at is delta G. Remember in math that delta means change, and now we know that G is energy, so delta G just means change in energy from reactants to products. And just like calculating the change in anything else, the math operation is the final minus the initial. 
In chemistry, the final stuff is the products and the initial stuff is the reactants. So figuring out delta G is just the energy of the products minus the energy of the reactants. Let's look at these graphs as examples and do some example calculations. In the graph on the left, the energy level of the products is 15 and the energy level of the reactants is 5. So we can plug in these numbers here and, and this is what we get. Delta G is the energy of the products, 15, minus the energy of the reactants, 5. Therefore, our answer is positive 10. Now, in this case, there aren't any units on here, but a common energy unit is joules, so that's one that you might see on here. So this calculation gives us an answer of positive 10. What this means is that 10 joules of energy were put into these reactants to make these products that have higher energy. And this reaction is endergonic with this input of energy. If you want, if you want pause the video here and try the one on the right before continuing. Now, if you did that one on the right, um, hopefully this is the answer that you got. The energy level of the products is 5, and the energy level of the reactants is 10. We plug these numbers into our equation and get 5 minus 10, and that gives us an answer of negative 5. Delta G is negative 5. This means that 5 joules of energy were released in the reaction when the reactants went to lower energy products. The energy difference is um, the energy that was released. This reaction is exergonic. As you can see, the curvy part of this graph isn't important when uh, we're trying to calculate delta G, but this hump is important and we're going to get into that right now. The hump in a free energy diagram is called the activation energy. You can define activation energy as the input of energy needed to begin a reaction. So why do you need an input of energy to begin a reaction? Why do you need activation energy? Well, remember from the biochemistry unit, one of our rules was nature loves stability. So most chemical compounds exist in a stable form. And a chemical reaction is trying to change that chemical compound. So to make bonds or break bonds, these stable chemicals need to be temporarily destabilized. Activation energy is the energy that's used to temporarily destabilize these chemicals in their transition to a new state. So this transition part where the chemicals are destabilized, that's actually called the transition state of the chemicals. And you can think about activation energy as kind of like a match that starts a fire. A fire is a chemical reaction, a combustion reaction. But to get this reaction started, you need a little bit of input energy just like you need a match to start that fire. Another good example of activation energy is like when you get a glow stick. A glow stick gives off light and that's evidence that a chemical reaction is happening, but it doesn't just happen by itself. You need a little bit of energy input to get it started. When you flex that glow stick, break the tube, that allows the chemicals to mix together. So on a free energy diagram, this hump right here going from reactions to the, the reactants to the peak, that's the activation energy. Right here at the peak, this is when the chemical is in its most unstable transition state. So it's a very high energy transi transition state chemical. And then the chemical becomes a little bit more stable on its journey to a, becoming a product. So again, um, to become unstable, energy has to be put into the reactants to become this unstable transition state. But then energy is released when that transition state chemical becomes a product. In other words, moving up the slope here is energy being put in and moving down is energy being taken out. So every reaction requires energy to be put in here and here. Every reaction gives a little bit of energy output here and here, but when we call something exergonic or endergonic, it's what's the net amount of energy. In the case of an endergonic reaction, more energy is put in than given out. In the case of an exergonic reaction, less energy is put in than given out. You can calculate activation energy by looking at a free energy diagram. 
to calculate activation energy, the formula is to find the maximum energy of the transition state, or this peak right here, and then subtract the energy level of the reactants. Let's look at these graphs again as an example. In the graph on the left, the peak energy value is 20. So we plug that in right here. The energy value of the reactants is 5, so we put that in here. If we crunch that through our formula, we get an answer of 15. The activation energy of the reaction on the left is 15 joules. If you want, pause the video here and try the one on the right before continuing on. In the graph on the right, the peak energy level is 20, and the energy level of the reactants is 10. So 20 minus 10 gives us an activation energy of 10. 10 joules. 10 joules of energy need to be put in to make this reaction go. So we've talked about what activation energy is and what it means and why it's important to living things is because a lot of the chemical reactions that happen have high activation energy. And what that means is the higher the activation energy means that a reaction is less energetically favorable. In other words, that means that the reaction is less likely to occur on its own if it has a high activation energy. But chemical reactions need to happen all the time. Organisms are breaking down molecules and building up molecules so, so frequently. And this is where everything ties together. In order for reactions to happen at the speed that living organisms need them to happen, the activation energy needs to be reduced. And this is where enzymes come into play. How enzymes work is they reduce the amount of activation energy required to get a reaction going. With reduced activation energy, that means that the reaction is more likely to happen. Here's, a, here's an example of a reaction that's not catalyzed. You can see that this reaction has a high activation energy, meaning that reaction is energetically unfavorable and not as likely to happen. But when an enzyme is put into the mix, the activation energy decreases significantly. And now, with only this short hump to overcome, the reaction on the right is the same reaction, but more likely to happen. To recap, we hit some high points here. Reactions can be described in different ways. Some of those ways we knew before, and the new one in this video is how to describe reactions in terms of their energy. Energy is needed to build bonds, and energy is released when breaking bonds in metabolic reactions. We learned about free energy diagrams, and how they're just graphs showing us how energy changes throughout a chemical reaction. We learned that all reactions require an initial input of energy to get started, and this is called activation energy. Activation energy can prevent a reaction from going, so enzymes make those reactions go faster by reducing activation energy. Bring your questions to class, and we're going to have lots of opportunities to practice this, so don't be shy.